Hello, my name is Robert Dean Steele, and today we're going to be looking at the prayer life and also as well the life of David. So, Father, we thank you today for this wonderful opportunity to look at David's life and also as well, Lord, the lessons that we can learn from this man of God. And so we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the thing that I love about David is that David was one of those people who came from an obscure place. This was a message, or David was actually not seeking what was given to him. And that is the grace and also as well, the favor of the Lord. Now, Saul, of course, was the first original king of the nation of Israel. And he started out pretty good. In fact, he started out prophesying. But then as time progressed, he became, you know, a, a person who actually began to believe his own press. And we have to be careful about that because the simple fact is if God decides to elevate us, if God decides to give us a place of favor and also as well, a place where we can go and, you know, touch others, well, then of course we shouldn't, what often happens is this, is that people begin to, you know, talk well of you. And if they talk a lot about you, then guess what happens? You begin to believe your own press. You begin to believe that you are something special and that it's not the favor of God that brought you about. Well, that was the one thing that David never lost. And that's incredible. Okay. So let's talk about David for a moment. Okay. So Saul had fallen out of favor, both with Samuel and with the Lord, because the incident that brought all of this about was he was told to go and to destroy the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites, of course, were the first tribe to attack the nation of Israel in the in the desert time. And now let's let's uh, you know we get a little bit well the Amalekites. Well, the Amalekites, of course, were descendants of Amalek, and Amalek had settled into the area of, I would call the Negev or the, um, you know, the uh, Sinai Peninsula is also as well. And they were also basically um, in charge of that area. They were desert nomads and they had basically carved out a life in the Sinai Desert and the lower part of Canaan. And here you have this massive amount of people who have just crossed the Red Sea and they're coming into your territory. And there's not just a few people, there's a massive amount. We know they had about 600,000 men, not including their flocks, not including their families. So most scholars put it around uh, 2 million people. Well, there is limited resources in the Negev. And so as far as the Amalekites were concerned, this was an invasion. So they decided as, you know, warrior people, they were going to eliminate the problem. They weren't going to share their resources with the Israelis, with the Israelites. So what happens is they gather their forces against, and, and this is really the first real test to the nation of Israel, because up to this point, they had been stone cutters, they had been slaves, they had been working in the mines and working in the cities uh, and also the fields of Pharaoh. And they had not, you know, fought any particular battles. They had been under subject, uh, uh, under taskmasters, they had been slaves. Now they're free and they're out there in the desert and here comes this warrior-like group of people. Well, Moses appointed Joshua to be the man in charge. And so Joshua leads this ragtag uh, army against a superior force in the respect is they were warriors. They knew how to fight. <laughs> so what did Moses do? Moses was uh, counseled by Joshua. He says, you need to stand on the precipice, on that cliff up there. And uh, you keep your hands towards heaven and you'll be an inspiration for us to fight against these 
warrior Amalekites. Well, the battle ebbed and flowed back and forth, and it all was conditional on how Moses kept his hands in the air. It was a symbol not only for the nation of Israel, but it was a spiritual connection. And every time his hands dropped, the Amalekites would win. And every time he put his hands up, the Israelis would win. The Israelites would win. So Aaron and Hur saw what was going on. So they sat Moses down on a rock and Aaron on one side and Hur on the other. And they held his hands up. And of course, Israel won the day. Now, fast forward for several hundred years, the Amalekites were still around. So the Lord decided it was time to deal with the Amalekites once and for all. And it would be Saul that would do it. So Saul was given that task by Samuel. And he. this is where it gets really interesting. He decided that he would allow Agat, the king, to uh, remain alive and he took the best of the land. I mean, we're talking the sheep, the goats, the camels, all of those things. And uh, then when Samuel finds out from the Lord, now get this, Samuel spends all night crying out to God on behalf of Saul. And uh, Saul, when, when Samuel shows up the following morning, I don't know exactly what he was expecting, I think he was probably hoping that Saul would, you know, relent from what he was doing. And so Samuel comes in and Saul sashes up there and says, hey, I've done everything God told me to do. Now, Samuel knew that that wasn't true. And he said, really, how come I hear a bunch of sheep and a bunch of animals in the background? That's when Saul began to um, backpedal. And he said, well, it's the men. They wanted to have this. And he made a bunch of excuses. And, and, and he said, and, and these animals are for sacrifice for the Lord. And that's when Samuel said, listen, Saul, I want you to know something. With God, it's not sacrifice. It is obedience. And so ultimately, Saul lost his um, kingship. And so the Lord, you know, here was Samuel lamenting and crying over Saul and saying, you know, he felt responsible for this because he was the one that anointed Saul to be king. And the Lord said, Saul or Samuel, don't do this anymore. I have found a man. And that man is from the house of Jesse in Bethlehem. And I want you to go down there. Now, Samuel says, wait a minute. If I go down there to anoint a new king and Saul finds out my life isn't worth anything, Lord says, what I want you to do is go down to Bethlehem and to, you know, come under the premise and pretense of having a banquet there. So guess what happens? He goes down to Bethlehem and the people of Bethlehem are well aware of the anointing and the influence of Saul. So they say, are you here for a war? Are you here for uh, other things? And he says, we're going to have a, we're going to have ourselves a, a banquet. And so they begin to have a banquet. And then he says to Jesse, he says, um, I want to see your boys. And so he parades his boys before the, uh, before Samuel, none of them are the ones that the Lord had called. So finally, Saul says, none of these guys are going to do. He says, do you have another boy? And they said, yeah, we got David. Well, would you send for him? So David is sent for, and he comes in and Samuel notices a couple of things. Number one, he's a good looking boy. Number two is he has the right heart. And so Samuel doesn't hesitate. He anoints David with oil and David begins his ministry. He begins as, first of all, a simple helper. Now, this is, this is where it gets really kind of neat, is um, when the anointing left him, and that's what we got to be careful of. We got to be careful that we do what God wants us to do, because what can happen is, the anointing can leave. We can find ourselves doing things in our own strength. Now, this is an important point too. David 
when he was chased around by Saul, he did not touch Saul. He respected the office and the anointing that Saul had. Even though Saul was chasing him and trying to kill him, David would not touch the anointing. And, and that's an important point because the gifts and callings are, are without repentance. When God calls us, God's not sorry that he did it. Now, if we choose to, you know, uh, in some way uh, not do what God wants us to do, we can find ourselves out the plan and purpose of God. And then when we find ourselves out the plan and purpose of God, we can actually find ourselves doing things in, in our own strength and our own wisdom, and we can do it in the name of God. And there's lots of that going on today. Anyway, David, prior to this particular situation, and this is where I love this, David had already been a man of prayer. David was out there on the sheep pen. And he was a bit of a warrior too, because when there was a bear and a lion that came to uh, kill and take from him uh, the sheep, David fought them and defeated them and killed them. So that got him ready, of course, to be the warrior that he was going to become. And uh, David was a multifaceted individual. He was a complex individual. Not only was he a warrior, but he was a musician. He was a singer. He was wise. He was obedient to the Lord. And that's what made him what he became. And we have records of David's accomplishments, but also we have the book of Psalms, which is half of the Psalms in the book of Psalms were written by David. And uh, when put to music, well, it's incredible stuff. I want to tell you that. Back when I first got saved, there was a group that was uh, basically uh, out of Hawaii, and uh, they were with Youth with a Mission. And they were putting songs, uh, like the Psalms, uh, to music. And we would listen to those music. And they were great songs. And they were songs that David had written. And I thought, wow, this is really kind of cool. So anyway, David, of course, was a man after God's own heart. Now, let's fast forward to just after David had been um, anointed as king. All of a sudden... Saul was having some tormenting. And uh, this is a very important part that we should know concerning praise and worship. The reason we should know about praise and worship, and I'm going to mention this all together because when I was reading in the book of First Chronicles, we have individuals such as Heman and Jeduthun and Asaph and Korah. They were men that prophesied under the power of music. Music is a powerful stimulant and sedative. And in, da in Saul's case, when David sang and when David played the harp, those, that, that spirit that was tormenting him would leave. And so there's a very powerful lesson for us today. And that is, if you feel overwhelmed by whatever Sing songs of praise and worship. I do all the time. I have a whole repertoire of songs that I just grab my guitar and I begin to sing and the Spirit of God comes into that moment and it's beautiful. And I'm grateful that he has given me that ability. Maybe you don't have the greatest voice. So we had a guy in our church. His name was Charlie. And Charlie, he had a voice of a raven, but he loved to praise the Lord. And uh, <laughs> I remember his family saying, he had two lovely daughters who had wonderful voices. And uh, they often said, Dad, you're throwing us off key. He says, I don't care. I'm praising the Lord. And so if you can sing or you can't sing, you know what? We're called to praise and we're to worship the Lord. So David then, you know, was able to do that. Now, of course, David then would defeat Goliath and David would become a mighty man. He would become a warrior and ultimately he became king. 
And when he was king, uh, and, and, and this is kind of neat. I mean, I'm fast forwarding here because I could talk about, you know, Goliath and the whole aspect of Goliath. But that, that's not where we're going today. Today, I want to talk about the prayer life and also the praise and worship life of David. David was a man after God's own heart. And David loved to praise the Lord. In many of his Psalms, he would say, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Or he would say, the Lord is our refuge. The Lord is our strength. I was just looking today at, uh, or yesterday at Psalm 34, verse number seven. And it says, the angels of the Lord camp around them that fear him. Today, I was looking at Psalm 34, eight, and it says, taste and see that the Lord is good and he blesses those who trust in him. Now that is so powerful when you think about what David was getting across. You see, David loved and understood the power of praise and worship. He understood that when you worship the Lord, it's an attitude of the heart expressed. And, and David would talk about different forms of worship. He would talk about the Shabbat, which was the shout. When we talk about the Shabbat, of course, a, a perfect reference to the Shabbat is what happened when Joshua took the city of Jericho. They marched around the city of Jericho for six days, one time. And then on the seventh day, they walked around and marched around with the trumpets blowing and everything like that. And the, the people didn't say anything. But when it was time, they let out a shout and the walls came tumbling down. Now, there's a great lesson in themselves. Using the shout, you and I can declare in the spiritual realm that we are victors in Jesus Christ. I mean, it's beautiful when you think about that. David also loved to, you know, he said, raise your hands and raise, maybe in his mind, he was thinking about uh, Moses and the nation of Israel fighting the Amalekites, which we talked about. And uh, so maybe that's what David was thinking about when he said, raise your hands. Now, Paul, of course, emphasized that in the book of Timothy. He said, listen, you got to raise your hands, with holy hands without wrath and without malice. When you raise your hands, you are connecting with God. It's, it's an expression of worship. He also talked about, you know, laying prostrate before the Lord, you know, and that is often a sign of humbling ourselves and being penitent uh, before the Lord. We're acknowledging that he is, is large and in charge. He talked about, for example, the wave of unto the Lord. You know, you're waving unto the Lord. And what you are doing is you are simply acknowledging him as he is the Lord, and you are making a decision for um, for allegiance. Then there's the dance. Now, of course, uh, <laughs> many of us in the church, we're not that great of dancers, but the simple fact is that, uh, for example, when Marion and the nation of Israel celebrated, that's in Exodus chapter 15, uh, you have Marion grabbing the tambourine and leading the ladies in a dance and they danced before the Lord. David danced before the Lord when they were bringing the um, Ark of the Covenant in uh, First Chronicles 16. He danced before the Lord. And then when Michal, his wife, said, that's not what you're supposed to do, he said, well, let me just tell you something, Michal. I am going to be even more undignified than this. You see, David understood that expression was very important. You know what really breaks my heart is when you're in a worship service, you're in a song service, and people are standing there like bumps on the log. And you're thinking to yourself, what happened, man? This is the most exciting news, the most exciting opportunity that you can have. This is one of the things that blew me away when I first was in my, uh, when I was in Havard, Montana on the Friday night. And I had never seen this before. See, in my church, we didn't do those things. <laughs> and, and I see all these long-haired Jesus people with their hands raised towards heaven, their eyes closed, and worshiping the Lord. That just blew me away. 
But I thought, this is, this is different. Well, after I got saved and I realized the beauty of the songs, when I realized the power of praise and worship and what it could do. And I mean, I, we were in a, a church that they shouted. They were in a church that raised their hands. It was a church in revival and it was wonderful. And you know, I had Holy Ghost goosebumps and all of that. But when I started, you know, playing the guitar, I mean, I used to sing with all the different young people. We had a young lady named Debbie Flowen, and Debbie would get out there with her guitar, and she would lead us in worship. And I had a friend whose name was Brian Brio, and Brian was a pretty good guitar player. In fact, I was in a group with him called Christian Love, and we were with our friends, uh, Jim Ramsey and Kurt Garber and George Ayers. It was, it was a great time. We, we sang all those, you know, Gaither songs and, and Master's Touch song. And, and, you know, can you imagine a bunch of hippies are singing gospel quartets? <laughs> it was, it was a real stretch back in those days. But, you know, also as well, there were other songs like the Sweet Comfort Band and, and, and all of that opened up a brand new avenue for me. And whenever I read the Psalms, I think of David with his 10 string lyre. And I think of him worshiping the Lord, whether it was in the sheep pen, whether it was with Saul, or whether it was, of course, in his own private time. Now, I just read, you know, uh, just before I started this particular time about David. Near the when he was established, he made uh, got a whole bunch of uh, Levitical choirs and also as well Levitical uh, symphonies together, and and they worshipped the Lord day and night. At each sacrifice, they would have a time of praise and worship. Can you imagine Levitical choirs of men? And I have heard men's choirs, and they are absolutely fantastic. You got the basses, you got the baritones, you got, of course, the uh, tenors, all moving together, singing songs of praise and worship. It is just absolutely electrifying. That's the only way that I can describe it. And this was going on during the reign of David every single day. And what were they singing? They were singing songs written by David and written by the great leaders of that time. We actually have in the book of Psalms, we have one from Psalms from Korah and Jedathun and, and Haman and Asaph. They're all there. And they're beautiful, beautiful pieces of literature, of poetry, and also as well, hymns that were written for the Old Testament. When you look at the book of Psalms, it is actually the hymn book of the Old Testament. And, and it's easy to put them to music, very easy. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye, all ye lands, serve the Lord, the Lord with goodness. Come before his presence of singing, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his course with praise. Give thanks unto him, and praise, and bless his name. For the Lord, the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth, and truth endureth endure it to all generations, all men. <laughs> I mean, that's just one song. I mean, there are so many different ones that we could do. The simple fact is David loved to worship the Lord. And I want to encourage you today to do that. Sometime during your praise and worship, and I mean, there are tons of really great worship songs out there. And Many of them are being, you know, sung in your local church. Get to know those songs and make them a part of your daily time with the Lord. If you want to use the word ritual, I do. It's so wonderful to be able to worship the Lord, just like David did. David understood the power of praise and worship, and so does the enemy. 
The enemy understands that too. That's why we have all these counterfeits that are going on. Country music, new, 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 new. Rock and roll, boom, 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 boom. You know, classic, la, 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 la. What, what, whatever. I'm just, you know, getting a little bit rap. Oh, yo, 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 hark, hear an angel sing. That sort of stuff. The point that I'm trying to get across is, of course, the fact that you and I need to worship the Lord. Now, let me just give you a little expression here. Worship is an attitude of the heart express. What you're doing when you're worshiping the Lord is you are acknowledging who he is. I mean, we could talk all day about who the Lord is. He is the creator of all the universe. He is all knowing. He's all powerful. He is eternal. He is immutable. That means that he is completely and totally holy. There is no wrong thing in him. And so you have an awful lot to thank. And, and the amazing thing is that he gave each one of us an opportunity for salvation. Now, whether or not we take that, that's entirely up to us. Of course, there's consequences to that issue. And uh, if we don't take up the issue or the invitation, then what basically happens is if we end up in a lost eternity, that's because we have paddled our own canoe. I was so glad back in 1974. And I, I don't know how many times the Lord really spoke to me. I, I remember when I was about four or five years old going to a vacation Bible school. And I remember the fact that Rachel Davies prayed for me every single day. She knew what was going on in our home. And, and when I walked through the door of the church, and, and, and that was really amazing how God did all of that. I didn't know that God was reaching out to me. But when he reached out to me and I finally saw it, I jumped on it as quickly as I could. And God has been good. I mean, that is putting the understatement. I was sitting this morning at the radio station and I was thinking about the fact that here I am on AM 930 The Light, which is, of course, CJCA, which is the first Christian radio station, actually, in all of Canada. And I thought to myself, here I am. Now, I was listening to a, a tape of ours or a, a, an advertisement of ours. And John Raymer, who was the voice behind it, says, we want to thank you for spending 30 years with us and supporting us for 30 years. And I thought, isn't that amazing? Now, the point that I'm trying to bring across is that I have been part of this journey for almost half of that time. I've been there for the 20th anniversary, the 25th anniversary, the 100th anniversary, and the 30th anniversary. Now, if you would have told me way back in 1984 or 83, when I used to listen to CJCJ, and it was a talk radio station at that time, that I would actually be on that radio station talking about Jesus Christ, I would have said, no, not going to happen. But you see, God knew that. God knew that when I was 13 years old and I got that uh, invitation from the Columbia School of Broadcasting, God saw so many, many years later that I would have the privilege of being able to do that. And, and, and I just love it. I mean, I get to talk on the radio about Jesus Christ, but I get to enjoy all these beautiful songs from all these different artists. And I love when people request, like one guy requested this morning, he says, I want to hear from Bethel Music and Amanda Cook. And I thought, that's great. There's another guy who phones off quite often. He likes to listen to Hillsong London. There's another guy who phones up and he likes to hear from... Um, you know, different, and it's just an amazing thing. People have their favorite music and I get to play it. I get to listen to all these different wonderful artists. Like yesterday morning, we had a guy phone me up and his name was Kevin and Kevin says, I want to hear Mark Stuckey, which is, you know, you, you give us hope. And I thought, yeah, that's one of my favorite songs and I love to li listen to that song as well. You know, it could be as well, uh, one of my favorite songs is from Rich Mullen called Awesome God. These are wonderful songs 
that you and I, and, and I was in a prayer meeting in my hometown of Claire's home last summer. And uh, I went to the prayer meeting and there was the pastor and he had worship music on. Now, obviously he cannot sing and obviously he's not a musician, but he wanted to make sure that the there was the right atmosphere. And that's what you want to create. You want to, praise and worship is designed to create the right kind of atmosphere for the participants. And so David understood that. And that was part of his genre. That was part of his charm, if you want to put it that way. David was a worshiper. David wanted people to experience what he had experienced. Paul said the same thing. You know, I love, uh, I'll get back to David in just a minute. I love what Paul and Silas were doing in the, in the city of Philippi. They had been, they had been captured, okay? They had been put into jail wrongly, okay? Now, if we're wrong, guess what? Usually, we want to lodge a complaint. We want to get on social media and tell people how things are wrong. And that I, t I think is a wrong uh, approach when it comes to social media. I don't, I don't want to get up there and complain about what happened to me. It's nobody's business, but many people do that. And uh, there are other individuals who have exploited it as well, saying, you poor baby, <laughs> and then, you know, give their take on it as well. I believe that social media should be a positive thing. It should lift people up. And that's why I love chatting with you about the things of God. I love to tell you that God has a plan for your life. And part of the release of that is praise and worship. And so when you, of course, focus on the Lord, David brought out, for example, and I will get back to Paul and Barnabas in just a moment, uh, Paul and Silas. Um, David wanted people to understand that there is a beauty of holiness when you worship the Lord. Now, let's go on to Paul and Silas. So Paul and Silas, they're sitting in jail, okay? And it's about midnight, and they're doing something totally unusual. They are worshiping, praising God, and the other prisoners were listening. That's how Luke recorded it. Well, that praise and worship released a spiritual victory. You say, what's the spiritual victory? Okay, an earthquake all of a sudden begins to rattle and roll through that place. The doors open, the prisoner's chains fall off, and the first reaction of the Philippian jailer is, oh boy, I'm in trouble. He knows that if anybody escapes, it's his life for their lives. So he's drawing a sword to kill himself. Now, I don't know how Paul saw it. He probably saw it in the spirit, but he cries out and says, don't kill yourself. Were everybody still here? Everybody was still in shock over what was going on. And maybe, just maybe, there were angels standing in the doorway saying, you guys can't leave. Either way, the Philippian jailer comes in and he brings the torch and he says, guys, I've been hearing you guys praising your God. What must I to be saved? And of course, he takes Paul and Silas home, dresses up their wounds, and then Paul and Silas get to preach the gospel to his family and the entire family gets saved. This is a marvelous story. What was the premise? The premise was praise and worship. Folks, don't belittle it. Don't put it aside. That's why we need to pray for anointed singers. That's why we need to pray for anointed song leaders. That's why we need to pray for a, a, a anointed musicians and worship teams, and choirs. Why? Because they help us to enter in. Back in 1980, I would say, I, I think it was about 84, there was a song that came out by Steve Green called Enter In. And I often sang it in my church in Yellowknife and in other places as well. I have a tape that talks about it. And it says, you know, come into that place and enter in. It's an invitation. When you have an opportunity to be able to praise and worship, please don't stand there like a lump. 
Don't stand there and say, hey, entertain me. It's not about you. You know, the church wars that we've had over the years, <laughs> believe me, I have had many. We were in our church in Salmon Arm, and we had a wonderful worship leader. His name was Michael Berry. And Michael had, we had a couple of wonderful people in our church, but the problem was they harassed poor Michael Berry because he wasn't playing the songs that they were playing. So finally, I had to have a conversation with those people and said, leave him alone. This guy is leading us in worship in ways that we never dreamed possible. I remember we had a, we had a Christmas presentation and uh, it was something that we did every year in the city of, of uh, Salmon Arm. And his wife and himself, that was Michael. Michael went and he played his guitar and his wife did what we would call inspirational dance. It was the most beautiful thing that we had ever seen. And people afterwards said, is he in your church? I said, yes. Oh, they are absolutely wonderful. And they were tremendous. And I was in another church just after that. And we would have this one guy come up every single Sunday. And he would complain about the worship and what was going on. And, you know, it wasn't according to his. Finally, I just said, brother, let it alone. It's not about you. It's not about your style. It's not about what you want. Stop it. And not that long afterwards, I heard a wonderful illustration that just brings it home. And I want to share it with you because it's, it's a very powerful story. It's the story of the Gadarene demoniac. Now, when you read the text, what's going on is Jesus is coming across the Sea of Galilee. He's going into the area of Gadara. Now, the backstory of this guy is that he is demonically possessed by 2,000 to 4,000 to 6,000 demons. He was, in, he was literally um, filled with a legion of demons. And he would run through the graveyards and he would cut himself and he was so powerful with demonic power that when they tried to bind him, he'd break the chains. And we're not talking, you know, bungee cords here. We're talking big, thick chains. Off they go. Well, when Jesus comes into the area, the man comes running towards him. Now get this, according to the biblical text, he was going there to worship Jesus. Something inside of that man wanted to worship Jesus. And no demon of hell is going to be able to stop you from worshiping if you really want to worship. We know that from the incident that happened afterwards, there were 2,000 pigs that ended up, of course, drowning in the Sea of Galilee. And you know, because they, those demons basically said, don't cast us out the outer darkness, send us in the pigs. And Jesus did that. And uh, we, that's a whole nother story. But the point that I'm going to try to say to you is this, nothing can stop you from worshiping if you really want to worship. The only one that stops you from worshiping, the only one that stops you from praising is you. So take some responsibility and be like David. David was a man who understood the power of worship. He also understand the power of praise. When I think about praise, I know that there are many different, you know, um, what we would call definitions out there. But when I think about praise, I'm always thinking about thanking the Lord for what he's done. Now, I could spend all day talking about the things that the Lord has done and how that he has met my needs and, and touched my life, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's been pretty amazing. And I'm grateful for that. I mean, when I was sitting this morning in AM 930 light, I was reflecting on how good God has been to me. 
It's like Johnny Appleseed. Did you ever see that little Johnny Appleseed thing from, uh, from Disney? And he says, the Lord has been good to me. <laughs> what a difference between Disney in the 1950s and Disney's today. Anyway, let's continue on. The point is, when you thank the Lord for what he has done, and when you thank the Lord for who he is, and, and this is a very important part. I was listening this morning to Adrian Rogers, and I love that. He said this, worship is, you're not going to add anything to the Lord when it comes to his character, his essence, and his nature. What Adrian Rogers was saying was this, you become like the person or the thing that you worship. If you, for example, you worship the devil, guess what? You become like the devil. If you worship the world, you become like the world. If you worship yourself, then you become self-absorbed and selfish. But if you worship the Lord, guess what? You take on his essence, his nature, and his character. And that's why we need to worship the Lord because you become like who you worship. That's why Peter said, listen, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit is constantly pushing us towards Jesus because we want to become like Jesus. We want to have the same impact in our world like Jesus. And if you get that, then you realize that praise and worship is not about you and it's not even that you're adding something. You know, one of my friends asked me, well, why should I worship the Lord? And I just told you the reason why. Because you become like the object or the person that you worship. It's as simple as that. And religion tries to get us to follow behavioral truth. Man has been trying to recapture paradise laws since basically... Cain. You see, the issue of Cain and Abel is this. They both brought sacrifices to the Lord. Abel knew what God wanted. Cain thought he knew what God wanted. And so he brought the produce of the land, things that he, of course, had produced. Here it is. This is my, this is my offering to you. And the Lord says, listen, that's not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for what I desire. And, he, and the Lord said to him, Cain, you knew what was right, but you didn't do it. Now you're mad at me and you're mad at your brother. Sin is sitting right at the door of your heart. Now get this, it wants to master you, but you can master it. And that's a very important point. You and I can master sin, but we master it through our relationship with God and being obedient to God and realizing that God has already provided a way. And it's not what we want. Well, of course, we know that Cain, he couldn't kill God, all right? So what does he do? He takes his anger out on the next best thing. His brother kills him and then cries the victim. Oh, what you're asking? I mean, he got some consequences. There are consequences to what we do. Some of it is not very pleasant. I know myself, <laughs> I've done some stupid stuff and guess what? The consequences have been there. I haven't wanted those things. I wasn't, it wasn't my desire at the time, but the simple fact is you reap what you sow. So he basically ended up becoming an outcast and his descendants and the descendants of Shem, they clashed to the point where God later had to literally destroy the whole world. Fortunately, God had a man in his place was Noah. And Noah prayed, this is incredible. He, he preached for a hundred years and nobody listened. It's amazing how people listen when all of a sudden the consequences happen. And in Noah's case, there wasn't any, you know, back plan. Noah was it. And when people all of a sudden realize that he was right, it cost them their lives. Uh, let's not be foolish. Anyway, back to David. So David, of course, was a man after God's own heart. He praised and he worshiped the Lord. 
And, and as I was reading today, and uh, I'm going to need to see how much time I've got. <laughs> I've been pontificating. Okay, let me close with this particular. I was reading today in the book of First Chronicles, and Ezra, who is the uh, writer of First Chronicles, Ezra, of course, gives a detailed list of all the different worship people. But it was interesting, and, um, and I remember saying this years ago, um, Lois's dad, my wife's dad, was a great scholar. He loved the word of God. But every once in a while, um, he missed things. And I remember we were in Three Hills and I was, you know, Bible college student. And I, I talked, I, I'd read First Chronicles a couple of times up to that point. And, uh, and he was talking about David and he was talking about Solomon. And, and, he's, and, and uh, I said, well, I guess you know that David supplied everything for the temple. He says, where'd you get that? And I said, well, the book of First Chronicles. And Lois's mom, whose name was Marita, she whips it out and says, oh yeah, it's uh, Chronicles 27, 28, and 29. And he goes, I never saw that. And I thought to myself, wow, even an educated man can miss it. The simple fact is that David, when he knew he couldn't build the temple, he didn't soft soap. He didn't get selfish. He didn't get mad at God. You know what he did? He says, okay, no problem at all. I will do everything I can to help this boy out. And so David organized all the material that was necessary. And then David gave from his own um, resources. David was a very rich man as well. And he gave his wealth to the temple. And then I was also reading how that David then gave the plans that God had given him to build the temple to Solomon. And he says, Solomon, I've done everything I can. I know that I can't do this, but I know that you will. And so I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that the project is done. He supplied the resources. He supplied the plans. He put everything into place. And then when it was ready, he gave it all to Solomon. And he said, Solomon, you know what? God's going to be with you. God's going to help you. You need to. And he said, he's inexperienced. He doesn't know what he's doing, but he will grow into the message and into the king. And he did. Solomon grew into the king that David really believed him to be. Now, of course, we know that Solomon later on became not so good. But in those early years, Solomon was a man after God's own heart, just like David was. David was a man who understood that even though maybe he wasn't given the opportunity, he knew that he could do everything. In his, that's, that is real support. That is a man who isn't into it for himself. He knew when he heard the Lord tell him through the different means and methods that were spoken to him about that, guess what? He didn't get mad at God. He just said, okay, I understand. I understand what I've done. I understand what's happening. So I'm going to do everything I can to help out. And, and you read about David's reign. And you read about the people that he had in his ministry and following him. Now, David wasn't perfect. We know that. Ezra neglected in his uh, particular um, chronolo, his, his particular uh, outline and his particular book, he left out that David had committed Bash with Bathsheba. He left that out because that wasn't the emphasis of what he was trying to get across. What he was trying to get across, and what when you read the book of First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, you're getting a spiritual view of each and every one of the different kings. For example, let me just tell you this. Manasseh, when I was reading about Manasseh in the book of First Kings or Second Kings, the guy was an absolute reprobate. But in the book of Chronicles, 
Ezra gives us a different point. He said, listen, yeah, it was bad, but then he was taken into captivity. And when he repented, I mean, Manasseh repented and was then transported back to Jerusalem. The writer of Kings was giving us, of course, the history. Ezra was giving us the spiritual history. And so the simple fact is that that's why we need these books. And that's why we need these testimonies, because we need to have the whole picture. And that's what I love about the Word of God. We get the whole picture, or as much as the, as the Holy Spirit inspired the writers to give this type of history. David, I love him because of the simple fact is that he loved the Lord. And his life is a life that we can look at and we can say, yeah, I'd like to be like him in that respect. I do want to close with this one final story. It is the story that was left out by Ezra. And it's the story that David did in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's the story of him and Bathsheba. Yes, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And when he was exposed by Nathan the prophet, he did not, you know, blame it on Bathsheba. He didn't blame it on, you know, the time of the year. He didn't blame it on his hormones, whatever it is that he would have, many people would blame it on. David took full responsibility. And we have Psalm 51, which is, of course, where he says, against you and you only have I done and done this evil in your sight. And then he says in verse 10, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from preparing your presence. Take not the Holy Spirit unto me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. David repented. Now that didn't mean that there wasn't consequences. Was there was. The child that was born to David and Bathsheba passed away. But that's not the end of the story. You see, even though David wronged <clears throat> and there were consequences to what happened, the next child that was born to David and Bathsheba was Solomon, the wisest man of his generation. And next to Jesus Christ, probably the wisest man that ever lived. You see, God can take the bad that we do and the calamity that we can do and the terrible things that we can do and turn it around for good. That's why Paul could say, like he said, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Lord, today we've talked about David and his prayer life and his life in general. We've also talked about other individuals. Father, today, I pray that we will praise and worship like David and that, Lord, we will have the same attitude that the Apostle Paul had when it came to adverse situations. And that, Lord, today, we would be examples of Jesus Christ. Jesus, I love him, especially the story of mom and dad finding him in the temple when he was 12 years old, when he said simply this, where else would I be but in my father's house doing my father's business? Lord, I pray that we'll do that today. I pray that we will take these examples that are given to us in the scriptures as I've been going through again. Oh, I love this. It's been just an educational time for me. Every time I go through the word, I find something new, something different, something I hadn't seen before. And Lord, I thank you for that. And I thank you for the application that we can use in the word. And Father, I pray from now on that we who love you, instead of using our social media to snipe at each other and to, you know, troll on people who don't necessarily agree with us, that Lord, instead, we'll use it to edify and touch others for you. And I pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. Well, of course, if you like what I've been hearing, what you've been hearing, and also uh, what you've been seeing, then press the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel. My name is Robert Dean Steele. God bless.